when I was asked to uh, to put together something for this presentation, um, I was asked to look at some of the global and commercial realities facing grain growers, and it it struck me it's interesting to look back, say, ten years, and and think about some of the changes that have occurred, and uh, it was really highlighted to me the other day. Um, I've got a lazy layabout son who's finished his HSC and thinks he's into the good life and he was lying on the couch watching uh, some AFL and it happened to be a game from about 10 years ago and it was quite fascinating to look at the differences, all black boots, different size shorts, uh, different body shapes and, and I suppose one of the things about that is we don't notice those changes year to year but when we, we try and stand back and, and, and really have a look at how things have changed over a decade or so, um, you start to notice those sort of things and uh, I guess that uh, triggers questions about whether we need to respond to that and that certainly comes under the heading of the, the, um, the workshop or the, uh, the sessions today about uh, robust cropping systems. So if we look at um, some of the major changes over the last decade, I guess we could look at them from a global perspective or we could look at them uh, more from a domestic level. Um, if we start at the, the global level, um, we've certainly had some major changes in international grain markets. Um, probably a decade or a bit more ago, it was quite common for governments to have um, stocks of grain and to intervene in the grain markets. And in fact, it was one of the banes of um, operators in the market's life that, uh, that, that uh, in involvement by government uh, used to have a role in some of the markets. Um, that certainly changed. Biofuels, really the growth in biofuels has occurred over the last decade to the extent now that biofuels are accounting for about 10% of global grain and oilseed production. So a major new market that wasn't there a decade ago. Um, protein demand, we're certainly seeing quite strong growth in protein demand amongst the middle classes in places like Asia. And that of course is having a, a direct impact on feed grain demand and feed grain demand growth has been quite strong. Um, global grain market consolidation um, and that continues. We've seen big takeovers occur, probably Glencore are the most recent ones. Uh, we're now down to six major companies that manage or control 75% of global grain trade. So that's certainly a change in the, in the marketing environment. Um, we've also seen major new exporters emerge, so particularly from South America and Eastern Europe. And we've also seen soft commodities almost become a speculative market, so whereas the participants in, for example, the grain derivatives markets used to be largely people at one stage or other who held stocks or had uh, reason to trade, um, it's now become part and parcel of um, the hedge markets of uh, major financial corporations to have um, an involvement in, uh, in, in, um, in some of those derivative markets. So all those changes are changes at the global level that have occurred over the last decade. And if we look at some of the impacts of those, um, if we look at, for example, wheat or corn prices at the international level, you certainly see quite a significant change. Um, you see the big um, soft commodity spike that occurred in 2007 and 2008, driven in part by some of that speculation. But you also see in both um, this upward trend in terms of global prices, um, driven by some of those factors, driven by um, the protein demand, particularly out of places like China that have now become a major buyer of uh, soybeans and corn, and also um, biofuels demand, um, locking up anywhere up to and increasing above 10% of global production each year. So certainly at the international uh, level, we've seen um, those sort of trends occurring in prices where if you went right back um, over the last uh, two or three decades, the trend was actually downwards in terms of grain prices. So quite a significant change. If you look at it as a composite level of grain and all seeds index, um, again, you see that same sort of pattern, perhaps not quite as extreme when you add in all the oil seeds, etc. But certainly, you see that trend of um, upward uh, price uh, trajectories since uh, the early part of um, the 2000s. Biofuels, I've already mentioned those. We've seen spectacular growth in biofuels. We tend to forget that they virtually were non-existent in terms of a source of demand in 2000. Um, the real growth in 
biofuel demand has all occurred pretty much since 2000. Um, we probably saw the first tapering off in demand globally over the last uh, 12 months. Um, uh, GFC, the global financial crisis, had a lot to do with that, but uh, certainly still quite strong growth occurring in the US with the renewable fuels mandate and also in uh, Central America. Um, and that's obviously having an impact uh, on grain markets uh, as a consequence. The emergence of new players, if we look at um, the major wheat exporters forecast this year, we see a number of players that probably weren't anywhere near as prominent uh, 10 years ago. So Argentina, uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, Ukraine and even India um, starting to emerge as, uh, as an occasional exporter of wheat. So, um, uh, suddenly the, the global picture looks a lot more complicated and if we go, that's just in wheat, and then if we go to total grains, um, we can certainly see uh, Argentina, for example, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Brazil, um, and some of the others emerging uh, that weren't really players in global markets. So that's certainly making the picture a little bit more complicated in terms of taking, uh, uh, covering off and understanding what's happening. And the emergence of speculation, this is the um, December uh, 2013 um, uh, uh, wheat uh, futures plot. Um, so you can see there that um, we've seen quite extreme movements and quite extreme ranges of movements even within um, months in that period and uh, getting a handle on um, wheat prices given the degree of speculation and the degree of um, variation that's occurring over time is obviously becoming more complex. Um, and if we look at uh, just a volatility index, just to get a picture of it, so this is a, uh, a measure that's used, it's just a standard de deviation of prices over a 20 day period and then plotted, um, but certainly shows that um, since that 2007-2008 commodity price spike, we've been in a, a fairly volatile market in terms of um, the, the propensity of prices to move up and down. So uh, quite a significant change from um, earlier, even in, even in the 2000s, let alone if we went back earlier than that, we'd have to go back to nearly the uh, mid-70s before we saw that sort of volatility. So those are, uh, are changes that are occurring at the global level. They obviously impact because uh, such a significant portion of um, production in Australia, particularly in the wheat industry, is, uh, is exported. If we go into the domestic market, we've certainly seen uh, quite a rapid rate of adoption of precision and, and GPS type technology. That's uh, certainly something that's changed over the last decade. We've run into a persistently high Australian dollar um, and that's changed the relativities of both input costs and also uh, grain returns uh, as a consequence. Uh, we've had a mining boom that's had a, a big impact on labour supply. Um, we've had uh, pretty difficult seasonal conditions over the last decade. Uh, we've had market deregulation finalised and uh, still some residual arguments about that. Um, and we've also had major reductions in public sector services uh, to the sector. So if you look right around Australia, um, the public sector engagement at an advisory and a research level in agriculture and in grains uh, has certainly been uh, dramatically reduced over that period of time and that has implications. And we've also seen changes in government support measures. For example, in Australia, um, governments have agreed there's no longer exceptional circumstances. Drought interest rate subsidy is going to be available. So uh, again, that changes the uh, risk, if you like, and the uh, risk profile of uh, businesses involved in the sector. So if we look at the Australian dollar effect, um, one way of looking at it is to plot uh, wheat prices in US and Australian dollar terms. And I guess what it, what it highlights to you is that for significant periods, even going back as far as 1980, um, the Australian dollar has been lower than the US dollar. Uh, the global market is basically set in US dollar prices. And so Australian growers uh, in Australian dollar terms have certainly been at prices uh, considerably above uh, the US dollar price. Another way to look at it is to look at the um, dollar difference, if you like, uh, from the global uh, or US dollar price to uh, the actual price uh, in the hand in Australian dollars for Australian growers. And you can see at different stages um, there's been as much as $100 uh, 
difference. So if the US was at $200, Australian growers were at $300 in Australian dollar terms uh, at different stages through that period. But of course what we've seen, oh, sorry, the, um, the dates have disappeared, but that starts in 1980 and goes through months uh, right through to the current. And of course what we've seen uh, over the last little while is in fact uh, at, a, at a dollar plus exchange rate, um, the Australian dollar price is in fact in, in Australian dollar terms less than the US dollar price. Um, and, and that certainly had an impact in terms of um, returns to growers. Uh, DPI cuts, uh, virtually uh, every state in Australia has reduced services and that obviously has implications for advisors and their businesses, but as well as that uh, for growers and where they can get their advice from. So that's uh, a factor that has an impact uh, and has changed over the last decade. So what, um, that's a, a quick Cook's tour, if you like, of all the sort of factors and changes and, and we're, we're aware of them at a, at, a, at a broad level, but we don't really, I suppose, uh, then think through. Um, each of those individually may not have much of an impact, but, but what is the broader impact of those um, when we look through and put them all together? Um, so if we look at, I guess, firstly, the issue of volatility and risk, um, there's, there's data around that shows that um, in terms of agriculture, Australian livestock, and, and these are just measures of volatility, and they compare the annual output of different nations. So um, uh, the bigger the bar there, the greater the volatility, um, and the average for all the nations included in that is indexed at 100. So um, that gives you some sense. So in terms of livestock production, Australia is about the average, about 95, 96 on the index uh, compared to uh, all those other nations. But when we look at grains, Australia's at uh, almost two times the average. So um, the volatility of returns to Australian grain production are almost twice as big as the average for most other nations uh, involved in uh, global grain production. So uh, quite an important difference in terms of um, Australian uh, agricultural uh, systems compared to um, others internationally. And, and when we, even when we put the livestock and the grains together, Australia's right up there, second only to Uruguay in terms of um, the volatility of returns to the sector. So I guess that's a proxy for the level of risk um, that needs to be managed by businesses in those sectors. If we go within the Australian economy, um, uh, agriculture wins hands down in terms of risk. Um, so the volatility of agriculture uh, compared to all the other sectors of the economy, uh, it stands out quite uh, significantly. So that obviously has um, some implications in terms of um, managing an agricultural business as distinct from managing businesses in other sectors of the economy. When we look over time, uh, if we look over the whole period from 1975 to 2011, um, and, and, and there's the level of volatility in terms of agriculture, we can see that at different times it's been slightly higher than that and slightly less than that, but certainly over the last uh, 95 to 2004 was perhaps a, a more volatile period than any we've seen, and then 2004 to 2011 almost as, uh, as volatile as that. So we've certainly seen um, the last decade or so um, that level of risk, that level of volatility has increased uh, rather than decreased. And uh, grains and oilseeds, no surprise, um, um, by far and away the most volatile sector of agriculture, almost twice as, um, as volatile or risky as other sectors of the, um, of the ag sector. And we can certainly see that when we look at, for example, um, farm cash incomes using um, ABEAR farm survey data. So ABEAR's each year surveys about uh, between 11 and 1500 farm businesses spread right across Australia. Um, and when you pull out of that the grain specialists, the grain, uh, the farm businesses that rely more than uh, for 50 per cent of their total income on grain and also production, um, this is the sort of picture that emerges. So you see even on the very crude analysis that um, the volatility of uh, farm cash income, so that's net farm income before you pay wages or depreciation or debt repayment. So it's it's really your cash operating surplus before you've paid your wages, before you're allowed for depreciation. 
or before you repay debt, but you have paid interest. So um, basically what it tells us is that um, on average, the grain businesses are certainly um, bigger, have higher levels of farm cash income, but have much more uh, volatility in terms of annual returns than, than most of the other um, uh, uh, participants in the broadacre sector. If we go through and look at some of the data, um, now, hang on, we've got a question up there. Um, we've probably come up a bit early with that question, and I'm not exactly sure how this works, but um, there's a question there, um, and I guess it's getting to the issue we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, on, the, on the back of that information, uh, have advisors here advised their clients to change their agronomic practices to reduce their exposure to production risk? Um, so, so has risk, and particularly production risk, been a factor in um, some of the decisions or some of the advice given to uh, their clients over the, over the last few years? Um, so that's the question we're going to ask. I think the way it operates, I'm flying a little bit blind here, is uh, uh, I get to keep talking and you get to uh, text yes or no to um, the, uh, uh, the number that they gave you and uh, eventually that will all come up on the screen. I think that's how it works. So it will probably distract us a bit, but anyway, we'll see how we go. Um, if we look at some of the key financial indicators, and this is at a very broad level, um, uh, so what we're plotting here is the changes in real dollar terms, so inflation adjusted dollar terms in, for example, uh, land values or debt or farm cash income for these farms in the ABS survey, uh, 1990 to 94, so that five years compared with 2007 to 2011 to see what it looks like in terms of uh, the changes that have occurred. So for all industries, we see that um, farms have got bigger, the land value has increased, um, debt has also gone up, not quite as much, and farm cash income has gone up uh, to a lesser degree. Um, what stands out to me in that is if we look at the grain sector, yes, the land value has gone up, so there has been um, both increases in land value and also um, uh, increases in debt, um, uh, but the farm cash income hasn't uh, changed to the same degree. Uh, if we look at mixed livestock sheep, some of these are a bit uh, difficult because they include quite a lot of small scale farm businesses, um, particularly in the livestock sector, and so therefore some of those things, figures get a bit distorted. But certainly I think the standout that comes out of that is that um, uh, over the past uh, decade or so, um, we've certainly seen um, a big increase in the land value uh, of grain specialists, but also a big increase in the debt and probably not the same level of increase that you would want in terms of farm cash income. If we pull that apart on a state-by-state -state basis, um, the standout is Western Australia. So um, the Western Australian uh, situation has certainly seen um, big increases in acreages uh, that the average farmer is operating there. They're now more than double um, the, the sort of average for the eastern states, but also big increases in debt. Um, and I guess that's uh, an issue in terms of how well um, that big increase in debt can be managed given the sort of risk uh, environment that those businesses are operating in. When we look at uh, a profile across uh, farms of a different scale, if that's the average for Australia in terms of changes in debt and changes in farm cash income over the same, um, uh, comparing those five years with those five years. Um, what's apparent is if we look at the middle scale farmers, so those anywhere between 100,000 and about half a million dollars annual turnover, um, the farm cash income change has actually gone down. They haven't taken on a huge amount of extra debt, but it's gone down. What we've seen at the large scale end is um, a big increase in debt and, and pretty much a, a zero change in farm cash income. So um, certainly some, some aspects emerge from that about how those changes have played out over the decade. If we look at um, those mid-scale farmers, 200,000 to 400,000 annual turnover, um, and, and split them up in terms of different commodities, um, again, those mid-scale farmers are the ones whose farm cash income seem to have uh, suffered over that period. So. Um, not managing the volatility, not managing the risk, uh, probably haven't got the scale of operation to get the efficiencies, um, and, and that's certainly um, a change that's occurred over that period of time. Uh, 
So that was where we were going to ask the question. Um, uh, looks like we're, we're getting there. I'll keep going anyway. I'm not sure how this is all going to work. So if we then come down to Victoria and look at um, farm performance of grain specialists in Victoria, um, again, the bars indicate uh, farm cash income. So they're the average numbers um, for farm cash income from the ABS survey. And, and the red line is changes in equity, changes in um, the ratio of um, assets to, uh, to liabilities. What's interesting there is first the volatility, which I guess we've already talked about. That's certainly um, uh, a feature of uh, grain production. So in any one year you can see a doubling or a halving of income and that is certainly um, an issue in terms of business management. I guess the other uh, aspect that starts to emerge out of this, and it'll be interesting to see where it ends up, is certainly we've seen a rundown in equity, albeit it's reasonably high levels still. Um, some of the ones in Western Australia are down around the 60s and 70s in terms of equity. So uh, where these average grain farms in Victoria are up around the 80 plus, um, it's a reasonably high level of equity. But certainly um, there's an indication that they have uh, been coming down over that period, which isn't surprising given the um, seasonal conditions that were experienced there. And uh, it'll be interesting to see whether that return in 2011 is going to change that. But uh, certainly um, it, it looks like there's been some pressure on uh, balance sheets over that period of time and uh, that's certainly something to be in mind. When we um, go in a little bit further and, for example, uh, look at, well, how are uh, crop specialists faring compared to, say, for example, mixed livestock. So in this case, uh, the average for the crop specialist was 75% reliance on uh, grain and oilseeds income. The mixed livestock were down at 50% or below. Um, and so what we're looking at here is um, if we look at the long-term trend in terms of income for those businesses and then plot the variability up or down in any one year, how are they faring? What do they look like? And I think the, the picture that emerges out of that is certainly um, during the 90s, um, the, the, the crop specialists seem to be experiencing bigger fluctuations than the livestock sector. Um, I'm not sure that's still the case. It looks like um, the, the crop specialists are probably um, uh, managing a bit better in terms of uh, the income in Victoria um, uh, and, and certainly no worse, if you like, than, than some of the mixed livestock specialists, bearing in mind there's a fair bit of um, crossover between these two populations. Um, and we look at um, cross costs and revenue to trend, um, uh, a similar sort of picture emerges. I guess what you're looking for here, um, the red is the variation in costs from the long term average uh, in real terms. The blue is the variation in revenue from the long term average. And what you're hoping to see is that in years when the revenue is down, um, that the growers are also managing their costs so that they're down. So what you're hoping to see is, or hoping not to see, is years where um, the revenue is down um, but the costs are, uh, are up in a worst case scenario or certainly not uh, reduced as much. And certainly the picture emerges that um, it seems as if growers are managing that more risky environment by being able to manage their costs um, so that they do uh, change uh, when, when revenue changes. So that certainly gives you an indication that growers are thinking about risk management and working out how to, to manage their costs to reflect um, uh, the situation. And of course some of those costs will automatically come down anyway, things like um, um, harvest costs, etc. if, uh, if the, the returns are down. So um, it gives us a bit of a picture. If we think about uh, the implications of all this for the future, um, I think there's an interesting situation emerging. It used to be that we used to be able to think about partitioning risks that farm businesses face into production risk, which, which uh, deals with uh, things associated with their cropping system, obviously things associated with the weather, and obviously things associated with people and how well they do their job. And then market risk, which was something uh, considered a bit separate, in other words, uh, manage your marketing program um, uh, without necessarily uh, having to consider uh, production risk, which is a separate thing. I think one of the issues that emerges out of all this is that um, to some degree 
the system, the extent to which, for example, you commit to dollars into the ground um, uh, needs to be aware of uh, the element of market risk. So if this price risk, the, 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 the market risk that growers are facing is higher, then, then it does have implications for the cropping system. It does have implications for the dollars that you put in the ground uh, in terms of managing that business. Um, can you, for example, reduce inputs early in the crop year and, and put them on later if the situation evolves um, uh, and, and that way manage that risk rather than uh, throw everything into the ground and hope like hell you get a good season. So those, uh, whilst those two have been separate in the past, I think we're starting to move to a situation where um, even those who are just looking at the agronomy associated with a particular production system um, are starting to think or need to start to think about what impact that has given the risk of the market that growers are running into. Will risk, risk change into the future? I guess that's a good question. Um, global uh, commodity price volatility certainly remains high and there's certainly no indication at this stage that it's slowing down. Um, government risk management support is decreasing. So we know that um, the, the foreshadowed changes to drought support, etc., are decreasing. So um, more and more growers are left on their own to manage that volatility. Um, global economic uncertainty is continuing and that's certainly been a big contributor to um, the risks we've seen over the last decade. But the signs of stabilisation are starting to emerge. There's starting to be a bit of a sense that um, the last actions by the central bank in Europe uh, are, are, are sort of stabilising things a bit there. There's some uh, green shoots emerging out of the US economy. They certainly haven't saved their debt, but uh, there's certainly indications that things are turning around. So that level of uncertainty associated with that global economic situation, I suspect at this stage we look like we're through the worst of it, although there's obviously um, some quite large uh, uh, debt issues to manage uh, on the way th forward. We are seeing some, some improved decision support tools at the farm level. Um, I was interested to note in Western Australia the government there has significantly enhanced the uh, availability of weather stations. So um, they've put out uh, about 150 additional weather stations and uh, are, are tying them into the system, uh, filling in a lot of the gaps in uh, the data that was available to growers and also um, putting together some decision management or risk management tools that allow growers to look at where they are in terms of rainfall decile and make some management decisions, even to the extent of in the eastern wheat belt in Western Australia, uh, completely um, knocking out uh, a crop when it looks like the chance of getting that crop to finish is pretty low. So um, we're certainly seeing the emergence of um, some quite good decision support uh, tools at a farm level and better management options at a farm level. But at the same time, we're also seeing more intensive use of inputs and technology. And, and that, of course, increases the, um, the cost base and the commitment to uh, expenditure for growers and, and probably works against, in some respects, uh, risk management to, to end up with a more robust system. So um, will risk change? Um, I think we're certainly not going to see any reduction in the commodity price volatility. And so managing that's going to be an issue for growers. Um, and these others, that's certainly contributing or exposing growers to more risk. Uh, this is probably at, at, a, at, a, at a stable level at the moment and, and hopefully not going to get much worse. Um, this is helping growers manage that risk. Um, this is probably adding a bit more risk in some, uh, in some situations in terms of production systems. Um, price risk management options are becoming more useful. We're certainly seeing uh, out of the deregulation um, the grain uh, players starting to offer options to growers that look a bit more attractive. Um, so that's certainly starting to happen. Uh, production risk management in, a, in an insurance sense, things like Weather Shield and Celsius Pro, um, they are available. So they're a little bit like the US crop insurance program but they're still pretty expensive. If you look at them, you can actually look at them on the web and look at options. Uh, you can either insure against weather events um, or you can uh, insure against um, particular outcomes in terms of uh, predicted yield. Um, but they're still very expensive and they're, they're not really 
whilst specialist crops like cherries, etc., are starting to use them, I'm not sure they're viable for um, for uh, broadacre cropping. Um, agronomy and technology options may reduce risk exposure, and I've certainly had a couple of uh, agronomists and advisors talking about this that they were heading down a track where. Uh, more and more chemicals were being used, uh, they were throwing technology at problems and getting to a stage where the cost base was just building up and up and up and probably the resistance base was also building up and up and up. And, and we're now starting to see people, um, uh, particularly in the more intensive cropping areas in the Liverpool Plains and the Darling Downs, talk about, well maybe less is more, maybe we have to back off on the rotations, maybe we have to start to use rotations to manage some of those disease risks and reduce things like chemical inputs. So in a sense that's helping to uh, manage that risk a bit better than um, just going down the um, pouring more chemicals at it, uh, at it uh, path. Enterprise diversity is also starting to be reconsidered. Uh, certainly in Western Australia um, they've gone right out of sheep. Uh, they've gone fence to fence cropping and there's starting to be now some reconsideration of that, that it's throwing all the eggs in one basket um, that uh, maybe there's a need to think about the, um, the diverse enterprises, including livestock, as a way of managing down some of that risk rather than uh, relying entirely on, uh, on, on pure cropping. And financial arrangements, we're starting to see, certainly nowhere near to the extent that you see in places like the US, but we're certainly starting to see uh, a bit of leasing and a bit of, uh, of those sort of financial management arrangements arise where um, uh, perhaps the growers' exposure to debt isn't quite as high, um, but they've still got the production potential. So um, I don't think we're going to see those emerge to the extent that you see in the, uh, in the US where almost half the land in some areas is, uh, is leased out. But um, certainly that is an option that people are looking at. And particularly as farm succession issues emerges and, uh, and uh, we've got multiple family members tied up in, in a pretty expensive asset, um, leasing that out is one of the options to, uh, to manage the way through that. So what are the conclusions? Certainly Australian agriculture is more volatile than, than most other industries and than, in agric than agriculture in most other nations. So risk is certainly something that is, is front and centre in terms of uh, the challenges facing agriculture in Australia compared to everywhere else. And I think that uh, brings an important point with it and that is that some of the business prescriptions that might apply in other sectors of the economy uh, need to be treated with a bit of caution in agriculture. And I think in particular uh, where you see advisors suggesting that there's a lot of lazy assets in agriculture, I think one of the ways a lot of farmers have managed their risk in the past was to have very healthy balance sheets, which meant they could also always go back to the bank in times of crisis. Um, whilst uh, uh, economists and others might say, well that's a pretty lazy asset sitting around, you should be working that harder, you should have more debt um, uh, and, and be operating harder. I think uh, that ignores the fact that um, the returns uh, are, are quite volatile in agriculture and that uh, degree of debt exposure that might be uh, quite comfortable to operate in, in other businesses is certainly uh, something you need to think twice about in agriculture in Australia. Um, small to medium sized crop specialists certainly more vulnerable to that volatility than was the case in the past. We've seen that that's certainly the group that seems to be struggling in terms of returns, keeping on top of the efficiencies, uh, costs getting ahead of increases in income and certainly we've seen pressure on that group and I think that pressure is going to continue. And to some degree there's indicators that mixed enterprise farms are coping better with the risk that um, those that have got a few bags. Uh, or, or a few uh, different uh, uh, pots available in terms of enterprise uh, are managing that change in volatility a bit better. And that's, uh, I guess, not, not surprising given livestock has had periods of, uh, of good returns over that period. Um, but certainly I think there's a lot to think about there um, in terms of how the sector will manage risk into the future. And, and as I said, whilst um, they're not always obvious at the time. When you put all those factors together, it's certainly an environment where the risk profile is different to what it was uh, 10 or 20 years ago, and therefore I think risk has to start to come into the whole range of decision making from agronomy right through to how the market program or marketing program uh, is, uh, is uh, managed into the future.
Will grain prices continue to trend up? <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Um, certainly I think the indicators are that we've moved to a new level and a new trend in grain prices internationally. All the long-term projections seem to indicate that. Um, the, uh, the bugger factor in terms of Australia, of course, is the, is the dollar. Uh, compared to where we were in the uh, 90s, uh, we're about 30% uh, under that in terms of uh, our exchange rate. So in other words, um, what price might have been had we still had the 1990s type exchange rates, uh, they would be about 30% higher than they are now, and, and that would make a huge difference. So I guess um, the, the issue is more complicated in Australia um, in that um, we've got to bring that exchange rate factor into it and uh, all the forecasts from The Economist are that that exchange rate isn't going to trend downwards in the near future. So I guess given that, it, it certainly appears as if uh, in global terms that price uh, plateau or that new price level seems to have been maintained and seems to be persisting. But um, I guess the exchange rate is the fact that uh, changes the picture for, for growers here in Australia. Uh, will government risk management support increase in line with any increases in taxes recouped from the ag sector? <laughs> At least we've got some optimists in the room. <laughs> the government has looked at the issue of risk. Uh, I chaired a panel last year that looked at the US style crop insurance programs and uh, considered whether they were viable here in Australia. Um, and in Western Australia, CBH ran a trial uh, over there of uh, crop insurance to see how it went. Um, I guess the two conclusions out of those two things were in terms of the government uh, and its involvement in something like the US crop insurance program, um, the reality is that the US government subsidises the US crop insurance program to the tune of about 70% of the premiums paid by growers. So if a grower, for example, had to buy $10,000 worth of insurance, uh, the government's paying about $7,000 worth of that uh, as a subsidy. Not only that, the government is also subsidising the administration, so there's a fee paid to the insurance companies for administering that program and the government also does all the on-ground work in terms of survey work. So the level of subsidy of the US government of the US crop insurance program is probably even higher than that 70%. Um, and I guess against that background, the question we were asked is, would a crop assurance program, insurance program like that be commercially viable in Australia? And of course the answer was no. Um, and certainly the CBH trial um, confirmed that. I think uh, for all the discussion and all the uh, calls for crop insurance, uh, they only had about 30 take out uh, cover. Um, so um, I, I think at this stage we're at a point where um, there's not going to be increased government involvement uh, uh, through extra spending in risk management other than perhaps through education and those sorts of things. So uh, I think there is certainly uh, a need for growers to understand that um, that risk is increasing, not getting less, and it's certainly something they need to factor into their decisions. Uh, can small to medium scale businesses improve average profit through leasing land? Um, I think there are options where it can. Um, uh, I guess it comes down to what the leasing rate is. Certainly if you look at um, leasing rates around that three, three and a half percent, um, the evidence seems to be that where growers, for example, have existing plant and equipment and, and can use that and, and optimise the use of that by expanding the acreages without necessarily increasing debt, um, that certainly seems to be uh, a situation where um, that can work. Uh, I guess it comes down to leasing rates. Um, the sort of anecdotal evidence around the place seems to be that if you get up to five or five and a half percent, um, you end up with the lessee basically just mining the place. It's very hard to uh, consistently get returns uh, at that sort of level of, of lease rates. So um, it, it, uh, it depends a bit. Certainly there are quite a few examples and some of the corporate investors that you've probably seen uh, mentioned uh, as buying up land are certainly looking at um, uh, operating those under leasehold arrangements and that creates opportunities for, for neighbours or 
or farmers who have the gear to uh, to take those on and, as I said, expand their footprint without necessarily having to go to the bank for a huge slab of borrowing. So I think there are options where, where it can work. Um, it, it, it's not, it's like everything, I guess, there's no universal recipe there that says it will always work, but uh, certainly enough examples to suggest it's worth having a look at.